Today we talked about decentralized media and democracy and we were joined by special guest Muhammad Naim who is a senior manager for strategy and partnerships at the Center for Inclusion at the American Immigration Council. We talked about everything from the historical context of our bipartisan media as well as how to make our media intake healthier. It was a phenomenal conversation and I'm so excited for you to watch it. So without further ado, let's get into it. Hello and welcome to The Trek. The Trek is a Civics Unplugged series where community members participate in meaningful discussions on topics that are too often neglected when thinking about building the future. Through prompting questions and provocations, we venture together into complex but important conversations related to building the future and democracy. We understand that this work requires ongoing dialogue, but it's a journey worth tracking through. Hi, my name is Mariam. I'm a 17-year-old high school senior from the suburbs of Chicago and a proud builder of the CU community and we'll be hosting this trek today. Um, we're also joined by some of our wonderful CU community members and special guest Muhammad for a trek on decentralized media and democracy. So we're going to go ahead and get started with a word association and when you see your name on the screen go ahead and introduce yourself and then give us one to three words that you associate with decentralized media and I'll get go ahead and get us started. So my three words are diversity of thought, um, just because I feel like with a lot of like monopolized media and democracy, we get fall into echo chambers of like similar thought patterns. And I feel like with decentralized media and democracy, we get a lot more diversity of thought. And then I'll pass it on over to Phoebe. Thanks, Miriam. Um, hi, I'm Phoebe Almanera. I'm from Dallas, Texas. I'm 17 years old and a senior in high school. Um, it's funny that you said echo chambers because that was one of my three words. It's going to be echo chambers, um, communication, and understanding um, because I think those are really important things when it comes to talking about democracy as well as decentralizing media. Hi, my, my name is Hannah and um, I'm 14 years old and I'm from Houston, Texas. And the, some of the words that I think of when I think of decentralizing media um, would be like echo chambers is one of them, but mostly it's um, mostly it's like when there's no center of thought. So it's like two extreme poles. Mm. Okay, hi, my name is Jahi and I am 17 years old calling in from Ohio and I would associate um, and I'm quoting a cornerstone media theorist Marshall McLuhan here. Um, medium is the message. Sorry, that's four words, but I feel like having a decentralized media um, is going to add a lot of promising and hopeful nuance to it. So. I'm Madison, I'm a high school senior from Burgess, Oklahoma, and my three words would be essential to sense making, because if you have centralized media and everyone is being told the same things without diversity of perspectives, it's really hard to make sense of what's actually going on in the world. So I think I should go, right? Because my name is next. Um, hi everyone, my name is Mohammed Naim. I'm from New York, Queens specifically. Um, the, the word that comes to mind is trust and accountability. Those are two words, so trust and accountability. Hi, my name is Chava Pumba. I am 19 and a first year at the University of Toronto and a builder in this community. And when I think of decentralized media, I think of the phrase acting on narratives. Um, I think our democracy is designed in a way where we kind of respond and react to our understanding of ourselves and also the world around us. And so it's really important to have decentralized media for that purpose. For sure. Those are all really, really good um, words that I feel like are great associations with our topic today. Um, but does anyone have any questions or provocations to get us started today? I actually do. So for some context, Recently, I've been diving into, I guess, like more centralized media, like watching unedited like press briefings and stuff because I'd never done it before and I was interested in it. And it really got me thinking about the role that media corporations play and how, I guess, like important they are. So my provocation would be right now, the media 
is doing its job or like playing the role that it's supposed to play. And then anyone can feel free to talk about how this provocation makes them feel or like their thoughts on it. Just go ahead and jump right in. I think this is really interesting because I've always seen media as almost like the last check and balance um, when it comes to like assessing our democracy and how it's going. And then even just like over the course of the past four years and with all the things that have been happening, um, it's really concerning because I feel like it's been compromised to no longer serve as the check and balance. That being said, though, I would say that it's still doing its job in the sense that like there's a very few, like there's a handful of people who kind of distribute and manage media, especially in the US. Um, and so they've designed it in a way that serves their purpose. So it is doing that job. And so it's an interesting kind of they're competing perspectives, but they kind of still hold true, both of them. Um, I think that Shabu talks about basically like form and function. And if we do investigate like the essence of medias that we see today, um, they're, they're business models. And because of that, their incentive is to have a lot more um, user engagement, no matter the means. And I think we see that um, we have to make a sacrifice when doing that because they have developed algorithms that are made to have to reap more user engagement, but that is very vulnerable because it can rad radicalize people and um, bring middle ground into the peripheries. Um, my opinion on that is um, I feel like the media right now is more one-sided or actually two-sided only. There's really usually not a third perspective. Um, and I think the media is definitely controlled by um, like the liberal side usually. And I feel like a lot of the story or the full story doesn't get out like the truth with without opinions added onto it, you know? I think Hannah touches on something really interesting about like human bias is going to be in everything that we listen to. Um, and I think now more than ever, we're challenged to look past that bias and to look at the headlines and sorry, not the headlines, <laughs> to look past the bias to look at the context um, of what the writers like mean or like what they're looking, what they're, what they're trying to communicate and things like that. Um, I don't know anyone else has definitely challenged me to reevaluate how I perceive the news or how um, I approach an article when I'm reading it. Um, it has challenged me to like look at different and more sources um, to get other people's perspectives on things as well. Um, so I think it's doing its job with you want to say that its job is to challenge us to want to learn more about the facts of what's going on. It's definitely, definitely challenging us because we want to get past that human bias and know um, the truth about like what's going on and how to form our own opinions about things. So like, can I chime in? Gary, remind me, is this the right time? Anytime, feel free. To Anytime. Chime. All right. So um, it's an interesting, you know, media as a check in the balance. I think when I first heard that, I thought, well, you know, a check on whom, right? Um, and so it took me to last night. Uh, I'm sure you all are well aware of what's happening in, um, in Minnesota. Um, and uh, so CNN was on the ground and there was, a, there was a gentleman that was walking by the CNN crew and he stopped and he turned around and, and said, your cameras are looking at only that side of the street. Why aren't you turning your camera on that side of the street to really uncover what truly is going on? And so, and so it got me thinking, you know, like the lens of a camera is, 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 is not just an instrument to show what is happening, but it's also to create, it's also as, as it serves, I think, as a, as, a, as a portal to have a much wider and a much bigger discussion um, um, about 
um, sort of the true nature of whatever it is that you're trying to cover, right? So I thought about trust and I, try, I thought about accountability and I thought about check and a balance and Hannah's right, right? There is a, quint uh, fundamentally there is a split in how media covers the, um, the events that are happening in our country. But my question here would be, you know, and this is something I'd like to throw out into the group is, should we look at media through the lens of ideology, right? So our political ideology, or should we think about potentially separating that so as to create a much more balanced perspective? Um, so I'm just, just gonna throw it out there. And if, and please let me know if you don't understand fully what it is that I'm saying there. Yeah, this is actually thing that, that I've been thinking about as well. And I was thinking about it. So like a, a good example, I think that I've been operating on is like the American jobs plan, right? So the, the American jobs plan is actually an infrastructure bill. And so like when I first heard about it, like I was watching like, like from the White House talking about, so I was like, oh, this sounds like really, really good. And they were presenting it like, you know, pretty objectively, just like with the facts and stuff. But then when I went to like actually watch stuff about it on the news and like people were criticizing it, like it was the way, it was in a way that I hadn't even like had thought about it before and like presenting so many different like perspectives that you just can't really get when you present things like objectively or like neutrally. And so I really do think that there is a function in having um, news outlets that operate off of ideology. And even if we try to, I mean, like Jay, he mentioned like, it's it's not it's it would be very difficult to create a structure where media companies would not be incentivized to you know work off of ideology because that's how you gain a following people you know know where to go when they want to hear a certain perspective like if i want to hear a like a more neutral perspective i know i can go to this outlet or if i want to hear uh you know from the right or left i, I can go to this and it's part of like their brand almost um but yeah I think I agree with Madison in the sense that like instinctively I want to say like no that it shouldn't be the case and then you should serve as like you know a completely like clear of personal opinions perspective on what's going on like it should just be the facts but in reality it's actually a really great guiding tool in the sense of like I'm I know that I'm seeking out like a very singular perspective and so that I, it almost insinuates that you don't have a full picture of what's going on when news is based on ideology. So even as I'm like understanding something like explicitly like my, like let's say my primary source is CNN, like I know I don't know everything because I'm getting it from this place. And so either, even if people were to say that like we're not separating based on ideology, they would be to some capacity anyways. And so I think just being continuously aware of that makes it easier to kind of mitigate that bias. Mm -hmm. A lot of this reminds me of what author of Brave New World Huxley said. He said, it's like, we're living in a world of half truths or quarter truths. And so if you look at like ideology and in essence, ideology is kind of like your opinion and that's shaped by your perspective and your frame of reference. And so connecting that to what Muhammad said, the lens in itself is like a frame of reference. Um, but also the lens is different from um, just like typography, for example, because photography or just visual imagery in general captures things and it kind of freezes it in time. So it's only able to capture concrete images and that um, inherently um, amputates like all the abstract things that are going on that we can't capture in the lens. So that's a limitation. And then also if we connect this into the decentralization of the media, um, Decentralization means that there's going to be a lot of voices, um, but if we see an increase in voices and therefore an in increase in volume, that's going to conflict with the scarcity of, a of attention because attention is finite. And so there is the friction between having lots of voices versus having limited attention. And because of that, we might end up having to churn out half truths because it's convenient and we simply don't have the time or else we would fall, fall behind. Um, and in the end, we might end up with like one dimensional narratives superimposed upon 
multi-dimensional conversations like Madison said. Mm. Yeah, so I totally agree that we should separate it from ideology. Uh, can I ask quickly, do you, does anyone here, well, two, I have two thoughts here. One, I would love to know in the chat how many sources of media that you actually listen to on a, on a, on a daily or weekly basis, right? So folks have mentioned CNN, like others have mentioned media, whatever it is, I, I'd love to know. And then, yeah, and this is just from an information perspective. Um, are you all aware of why we have such partisan media, like specifically in the United States? I would say that one of the reasons for having such partisan media, at least what I think it is, is that it's to push like a propaganda type thing maybe. And right. just for people to criminalize other side maybe so so Hannah thank you for that and you know and I certainly think propaganda is a piece of it but I'm talking about um institutionally um there were events that occurred in the 1950s and 60s and 70s but particularly in the late 80s that ultimately created the floodgates for the media environment that we have today and there's a specific reason as to why that happened and I'm you know I want you know, it's hard to have this conversation without knowing that, you know, those specific set of facts. And I'm happy to share them, but I wanted to know if anyone is aware of it. No? All right. So, um, so, so, so let me just sort of backtrack here. So back in the late 1940s, there was a, you know, most folks listened to the news via the radio. I don't know, it sounds a really long time ago, <laughs> but most folks got their news through radio. Um, and the federal government uh, wanted to control that narrative. You know, narrative was mentioned earlier on in the conversation, and so we'll get to that in a little bit. But the federal government wanted to ensure that the news that got um, from the stations themselves to the to American homes were accurate, that they were fair, that they were representing sort of a, a, a balanced view of what is happening. And of course, I want to be mindful of the fact that um, there were, you know, that 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 concept was certainly stress tested on all sorts of issues, and 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 and, and not stress tested on other issues, right? So at the time, I I would I would presume that the federal government was more focused on making sure that there was a fair representation of the economy, a fair representation of the might of the United States a fair representation of their tussles with Russia, but obviously there wasn't fair representation in the media as it pertained to the treatment of black and brown communities, right? So there was certainly that split. But historically, uh, and then after that time, there was something called the Federal, the federal Communications Commission. And the Federal Communications Commission was set up um, to enforce fair coverage of the news. And so for instance, if Muhammad had a TV show Muhammad had to represent not only a, a progressive view or a democratic view, but also a conservative view. It was built into the policy framework of Washington. It was a federal, it was a federal commission. And so uh, think of it in the same way like uh, we have, um, you know, folks on TV can't just go cursing around all the time, right? Because there are infrastructures and policies in place to prevent that from happening. Well, back in the late 80s during the Reagan administration, that Federal Trade Commission um, was effectively, uh, it, was, it, was, it wasn't funded through the next cycle and it was basically gutted. And once that happened, you then saw this enormous rise of partisan media, partisan media infrastructures you started to see the rise of CNN. That's when CNN was founded. You started to see the rise of Fox News and Newsmax. And so, and so as a result, we have the climate we have today because the federal government got rid of the commission whose sole responsibility was to ensure that we didn't have partisanship in the way in which we built our media infrastructure in the United States. And so it's important to learn that fact only because in the context of what we're dealing with right now really is the remnants of a very poor decision by the federal government back in the late 1980s. 
And that's why we have Fox News. That's why we have CNN. That's why we have MSNBC. And effectively, very, very narrow, but specific partisan media outlets. Um, this would not have been the case 40 years ago, 50 years ago. It just, it just wouldn't have been allowed by the federal government. And so, and so as a result of that, and you mix that with social media, it's created, I would say, the wild west <laughs> of information. And it's up to us citizens to be able to disperse as to what is most appropriate. So I felt that that was important, an important perspective, because many people actually don't know why we have sort of the media environment that we do, or like the personality-driven media environment that we do. Yeah. First of all, I never really like thought of it as something that could be pinned down to like very specific historical events. I thought it was just like yeah. a manifestation of like American culture. So yeah. that was very insightful. Thank you for bringing that up. And it kind of puts us the question of like, obviously there needs to be like an institution that kind of revolves around providing multiple perspectives. And in theory that space should have been social media, but it's turned out to almost like further amplify um, the media that exists now. So I'm wondering like what, how do you mitigate that? Like if you realize that there needs to be a place that kind of protects the way that like enforces, this is a better way to say it, enforces like healthier media that's actually reflective of truths. What does that look like? And maybe it's not like from a government perspective. I don't think it needs to be either because like that's not the most effective thing these days. Um, but like how, how do we kind of replicate something similar that apparently worked for a very long time. I think that might require some like infrastructure change, just looking um, at even just like the metric system that social media uses. It's very quantitative. It's like numbers, how many followers you have, how many likes you got, views and shares. And so if we can integrate a more humane um, infrastructure that replicates like organic conversations, you, conversations you would have face to face with people and be more courteous and respectful. And um, I think that might be a good starting point. Can you, can you explain what you mean by infrastructure? Do you mean like buildings or like more abstractly? Oh, yeah, yeah, more abstractly, even just like the, the act of scrolling through endless feeds, I feel like it's kind of overwhelming. If we're able to make it, um, if we're able to make it parallel how the actual world works, it's not linear, it's more cyclical and we kind of live more in an ecosystem while social media, um, like corpse in general, they, it seems to have like a very vertical integration. Something, um that you said really struck with me about like a more human structure. And it made me think of like my all time favorite media company, Jubilee Media, um, and they're purpose driven rather than numbers driven or over oh, anything else, they want to amplify empathy in the world. Um, and I think that's a great example of a healthy media company because not only are they able to bring a lot of different perspectives, but they're very intentional with how they do it. And I think if we want to instill systems with healthier media and people learning from different sources, but in a more positive way and not so echo chamberish, um, it has to be purpose-driven and not, and I think this would be like where the intersection of tech and, um, I lost the word, but where the intersection of tech and um, like purpose driven things to help society meets um, is that like algorithms would have to change. Like there wouldn't be such a, um, such an emphasis on uh, numbers and metric systems to like measure engagement and things like that. Like it would have to completely change the entire system that we have now. I really believe that the algorithms and the way our media works these days is actually really, um, obviously it's good for the platform and for them, you know, the creator to get more views and all this stuff and likes, but it doesn't really show people what they would see in the real world. 
just it doesn't give a diverse opinions or even just the outlook because you really get to see one side once you go down that rabbit hole with the algorithm. And I also want to like broaden the conversation around healthy media like it's not just like not having it be like super partisan also just like media that's healthy for the people that are consuming it like enforces well-being for them and so just thinking about the fact that like specific to like the black community so much of the media is surrounded around narratives that are like not by any means or stretch of imagination like good for them um it's either like a very limiting like scope of like what they can contribute to society or like an, a never-ending dialogue about like struggles the black community faces um and then especially now it's also like a very like there's a lot of content around some like very traumatic things that are happening so it's also a very traumatic experience to like be consuming content all the time like that and so a practice that i think informs healthier media is when people put like content warnings or trigger warnings on their social media posts um it's really good in the sense that like you almost know what you're about to consume and then you play you can determine for yourself whether or not you're in the mental space to like consume that content or if this is like the place that you want to be informed about those issues um so content warnings and trigger warnings are like really really common on like instagram now um and even like in conversation with like friends and people I will say, I'm about to talk about X, Y, and Z. Like, do you have the capacity for that? And the answer is no sometimes. And like, that is my favorite answer because it shows that like people are actually putting that boundary in place. Um, so I feel like that's a practice that doesn't necessarily stem from like corporations and companies, but like also just individuals. That's yeah. been really effective. That's really, really smart. You know, Chubby, you mentioned something that I, you know, because the conversation is about media and democracy, it's sort of in that, in that intersection. Um, and, and, you know, when I th just think about healthy media, um, um, the role of media is to shed an accurate light of the issues that we are, like they were met with in this country. But I, and, and media, there's been a lot of focus here on the institution of media, but not on the end user experience, like actually the user itself, right? And I want to get to that. I feel like there is there's things that we are expecting our, our, our media institutions to do for us, but there's also things that we can do as a result that then drives the, or, or really creates a shift in the incentive or the models of incentives. But, um, but while media is responsible for holding those in power accountable, I don't wanna, I don't want any of us to forget, at least I don't forget, uh, that we need to keep media accountable for the things that they too have done, right? If you look at, and I'll just take your example, Chabu, you know, like the uh, um, issues pertaining to black and brown communities and, and just marginalized communities overwhelmingly, the media is hugely responsible for creating the false narratives that certain communities have had to live under or have been the subjects of, right? And one particular example is, you know, um, well, obviously what had happened in the 60s around the civil rights movement, but certainly historically, right? Historically, media institutions were dominated by mostly male and white authority figures. And that is the lens through which most of the stories were told. And so, um, so I think you know, there's when thinking about the role of media within the context of a democracy, particularly a diverse democracy like the United States is, um, I often like to think of it from the context of the user itself. And then, of course, certainly um, sort of the institution or really the platform. And that can be Facebook, Twitter, CNN, Fox News, Medium, like whatever it is that you want to consider. And then certainly those who are telling the stories themselves. Right. So it's the storyteller, and this is the journalist, i.e. journalist, whatever that means to you, moves through the institution and then moves to the user. That entire pipeline is the media. And so when we think about ensuring that there's fair democratic representation and fair and accurate information telling, 
we need to think of each of those pipelines or verticals. Um, uh, because once you start to, um, uh, because if there's heavy emphasis or on any one of those domains, that then you really start to create an imbalance in the system. And I think that's not good. Um, so it's just, you know, like you mentioned something that is very, very smart. So I just want us to think about this is much more complex than just the platform itself. Although I can, I can, I can see why that's such a hot topic. I would like to add that I feel like one of the false narratives that the media is pushing right now is um, that like minorities are oppressed, um, which is not true necessarily. Um, I don't think it's true, but I feel like it impacts the user and the consumer very negatively um, because then they have this feeling like I can't do this or, and it also kind of instills hate in them also. This almost reminds me of something that Chabu said in a different track, and it was like, I think it was on hip hop actually that it's kind of like a reflection of society itself. And hearing what Mohammed said, um, it's definitely a two way street users and the engineers behind media. And yeah, I'd like to um, emphasize that media itself is just like a neutral thing. Um, almost everything is a neutral thing. And it really depends on both sides to not make it a negative, corrosive thing. I kind of want to highlight something that Hannah said um, about the false narratives of minorities being oppressed. Um, I mentioned this in the chat, but I think what becomes true is the fact that like false narratives can become very self-sustainable in the sense where like if you prophesy something for a given community and exclusively mention that for who knows how long, like the intergener intergenerational implications is that there's follow through. And so it be so it, then people are like, oh, well, like then it's true now because like this is how people act and engage. But in reality, like the consumption of that narrative has was the seed that actually planted that rather than like imposing that responsibility on the community itself. And so that's very hard to look at through the lens of just like present day, like that really, really requires a much wider historical assessment of what's going on, which is not something that we see often um, now, but then that's the beauty of like documentaries. Like they have been really, really great about kind of giving you that more holistic look of events that came to be um, through a more historical lens rather than like what is happening right down right now, present day. That's a great point, Chabu, thank you. Um, and I just want to point out that we have probably time for one more question before we get into our reflection and application. So does anyone have anything that they'd love to discuss that we haven't gotten to yet? Or we can also feel free to continue on this like thread that we're pulling on right now. Um, but feel free to open up and post anything as well. Um, I guess one thought is that I wonder if if we zoom out to like the objectives um, of what we're trying to achieve instead of just getting stuck about like a media and also probably a particular mental model of what media is. Um, if we're trying to build, build bridges, is it that we have a different, like a better New York Times or like a better Vox or is it like, do we have not like projects that actually bring people together in person? That, that they can work on. I don't know what that is, right? Infrastructure would probably be pretty cool to, for people to work on together. Uh, we know that um, there's a lot of people, you know, decades ago that became like less racist once they worked with people in the same like military outfit, right? Um, I think the same could be done in other ways. But I just think it's really hard, the, the, the incentives the incentives to create a balanced media outlet is like zero. Right, right. There's no financial incentive. A good example actually is Australia. Have any of you followed what had happened in Australia just like a month ago? Sorry, I'm like a, I guess a news buff in a way. Well, this is actually really, really important to what it is that we're discussing here. 
um, the Australian government wanted to um, wanted to regulate um, um, Facebook and Google as it pertained to the editorial content that was on the site and that Australians were viewing, right? Um, Facebook, Google, and other tech platforms, they effectively pay nothing for the editorial content of other institutions, right? It, it goes onto their site and their site propagates the stories and only Facebook gets paid. CNN, you know, um, all the editorial uh, um, um, folks don't get paid at all. And so it's a, so effectively Facebook becomes the dominating um, uh, so, so monopoly of information. And so Australian government wanted to regulate that and create some sort of an incentive structure and cost sharing structure or a profit sharing structure. Facebook didn't want any bit of it. And so what Facebook did was it literally shut down in Australia. Imagine that a tech company just says, you know what, fine. If you're not gonna give us what we want, then we're just gonna shut down the service. There's an enormous ecosystem of actors that relies on social media to share important and emergency information. So for a company like Facebook to say, we are clicking off in this country, that is exponentially dangerous to the society. And so it just goes to show that for a company like Facebook, they have no incentive structure to share balanced media or to profit share or to do any of that, right? And so I think um, there needs to be significant focus certainly on regulating these companies, but in the same time, recognize that we are the end user. And so to Gary's point, what is it that we can participate in and build and create or advocate for that creates a much more powerful and whole pi picture of any one particular issue. Um, um, and, and unfortunately, the fate of our democracies truly does rely on the flows of information and the flows of information are monopolized by these tech companies, so. Hmm. I think I'm in full support of like looking at things from like a consumer's perspective because at the end of the day like what a consumer wants business models will follow like that is like the most fundamental concept of like how things work and I think like and I, I like the question that you posed here Gary of just like what do we want from this and I think that we like personally I would prioritize protecting narratives um, historically, that has been the most influential. And if you're like trying to enforce a better future, the narratives that you're embedding now have more relevancy than like all these potential like laws and bylaws that would control companies and organizations because you're shaping the perspective of like those who will be in those roles later down the line. And so I feel like that has a more systemic effect like over the course of like decades and histories and generations. So having measures to not only protect narratives, but then also just like as consumers be super cognizant of the fact that like the music I listen to, the books that I read, the tropes in the movies and shows that I enjoy cannot be like the sole source of information on like how I understand and therefore engage with like other peoples, with other people, other communities, other nations, and et cetera. So I think just like really, really emphasizing that the fact that like a narrative is so, 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 so important. Like if there's one thing to value, that's like not money or military, it's definitely that one as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I think this is interesting, but I also think it's worth noting that like the consumer is in a very different standpoint for a business model like media, as opposed to like other types of businesses, because the media has the control of shaping the national like the, the conversations people have and what people even know in the first place and so it's like essentially i mean a good example is that of that is the media making it seem like america every american is essentially like hyper polarized and at each other's throats if you looked at the media you would probably think that um for a lot of media outlets but when in reality like 40 percent of americans are independents 
and things like that. And so it really just shapes what people even think is happening. And so oh, I feel wow. like people don't even have, like consumers don't really have as much control over the media as we think especially opposed to other businesses and so in that sense I don't really know if I would say it's like the fourth branch of government or like the the checks and balances because like in a like a democracy it's like the people have the ability to uh shape it or whatever but I just don't see that as being as true for the media That's a great point, Madison. Um, and I think, I feel like this comes to a point where we're like at these odds with um, like the consumer and the company. Um, but if no one has anything else to add to this current provocation, then we can definitely move into our reflection. But I wanna open it up because I know this is um, a lot of thoughts on this in case anyone didn't have a chance to add something in for this last one. Okay, seeing nothing, we can definitely move on to our reflection. Um, yeah, so does anyone want to get us started? Hey, Mariam, would you mind sending the link to the notes? Of course, um, it is right in the chat. I think I could offer my reflection. Go for or, it. Yeah. So as for now, I personally, as just like one um, statistic among the business model and algorithm, I don't know if I can do much from the other side, but as a consumer, I feel like I should almost decentralize the way I consume information. And so place le lean less on media and maybe read more books um, go visit more museums, talk to people who are from different demographics and just engage in ways. Yeah, and diversify the way I receive information. I have like a similar reflection to Jaehee in the sense that like, I think learning through all kinds of mediums and experiences primarily is so, so, so important. And a thought that I've like always had about like, like the, the importance of narratives was something that was like explained to me like about a year ago. And I really struggled with understanding how can you like play the role of like not perpetuating that challenge without being the one to like actually create media yourself. Um, but I think that this, not this conversation didn't necessarily answer that question, but it did further clarify kind of like the dynamics and relationship between like the business component of media and like the, the individuals that consume it. So thank you for that. I really appreciate it. I don't mind going. Um, I definitely think I learned a lot more about like the historical aspects of how media um, came to play such an important role in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, there was a lot of things that I didn't know that I really learned about and those I want to do more research on now because um, it was really interesting. Um, yeah, and I think I came away with a lot of amazing insights on protecting narratives um, and the importance of trust and accountability in media. Wait, Hannah, we can't hear you. Is there any way that you can like speak to your speaker? No. Not really. It's like coming in and out. Mm -mm. Definitely can't hear you now. If you want, we can like come back to you. Mm -mm, we still can. Do you want us to come back to you at the end and like, like, okay, perfect. Um, I guess something that I'm kind of wondering now is like, what does it even mean to do your research on a topic? <laughs> like it's, it seems like it's just so hard to because when, 
media is so closely tied to ideology it's like are you ever really getting the full picture of something and especially when like when the media often presents like two drastically different perspectives like what about the middle like there's probably you know things that are right and wrong about I mean, there is things that are right and wrong about every perspective and so it's just leaving feeling like it's like impossible to get the full picture on any given issue um yeah you know my i mean there's just so much to talk about here and to and to share you know one thing that i that i think about quite a lot so just as a and i, I think i've told this to gary or i shared it with him i watch a lot of fox news um and i watch it um not because i'm particularly interested in their like outrageous views sometimes but um i watch it to just to just really understand uh, really their process of thinking, of reaching certain conclusions based off of the facts. And it's, it's, it's actually quite fascinating. And I, you know, I watch CNN, I, I read all sorts of stuff. And so for me, having that balanced diet is extremely, extremely important um, um, because our media does swing along an ideological pendulum. And so it's extremely important for me, someone who works in politics every day to have a pulse on that. Um, another is, and th this is just, I've seen this happen over the last decade in particular, is what we've, uh, the, the, the sort of the legacy media institutions, and I mean like the CNNs, the Foxes, the MSNBCs, et cetera, they have built out a model of personality driven news. And so like, we don't talk about Fox News, we talk about the Hannity show, right? Or like Tucker Carlson on CNN, like we talk about Don Lemon, right? Or, you know, on MSNBC, you know, name your anchor. And so these are all personalities that are driving the traffic. And, and you know, like nightly news is entirely like that. Um, sorry, primetime news, not nightly news, primetime news. And so um, I would, and so my reflection here is how is it that we can create an entirely new class of media that is accurate, that does speak true to the experiences of the people that are sharing it um, in a way that's not connected to personality, but connected to facts and reality um, and conscience. Um, and so you know, we're a long ways away to that, but I want us to be at least somewhat aware that that is the media environment that we are often living under is a personality driven environment. And that is not what media should be, period. Um, that was a great point, Mohammed. And I guess related to that, my reflection, um, I'll just jump in with, her, with her reflection, um, is um, that I'm gonna do a lot more thinking about how do you change incentives about just information in general to be more truthful. Um, and I think that if it's not tied to accountability, it's not gonna happen. Right, like um, you wouldn't necessarily talk about like whatever a architect does or whatever those people do that figure out like how to lay a foundation for a building. Like you wouldn't say that, that that's related to, Fo to Fox News, but it is. This just so happens that the Fox News stuff th th is not, well, it actually does have to do with a lot of people's lives, but in, they're just such a more clear line of accountability of people giving information related to a foundation of a building than whatever whatever the fuck Sean Hannity talks about, right? Yeah. Definitely. Um, Hannah, do you want to try unmuting it? Okay, we can't hear you, but Hannah did put her reflection in the chat if y'all want to take a minute or two to look it over. Um, Mm. Agreed. Okay, and with that, that brings us to the end of our trek. So I know it wasn't any of y'all's first time at a trek, um, but how did it go for you all? Did you enjoy it? Any thoughts, opinions, things we can improve on? I'll greatly appreciate it. 
so illuminating. Um, I especially appreciated the historical background. That was like an enlightenment. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, definitely. That was really, really interesting. I appreciated that a lot. Um, and we'd love to have you back for any checks in the future to give us more historical perspectives or random news stories. Um, that definitely gave us a lot of perspective and context of things. So thank you for that. Um, but if no one has anything else, um, oh, Chabu, go for it. <laughs> I wanted to like quickly say that I really, really loved the like last question we did about like what's our objective out of this. Um, I love treks. I've been a part of so many, but I think it's like hard to kind of like have an identifying and like application conversation without like determining what our objectives are. And so that was like a really great focusing question to have on the end. And I'd love to see if we can do that more often. Mm, that's a good point. Yeah, definitely. I love that idea. And I feel like it orients us better towards the end of the conversation anyway, if we just start like winding down to like objectives and reflection, application, closing. So definitely, definitely. Okay, well with that, I will leave you all to have a wonderful rest of your day and hopefully see you more at Trex in the future. Bye everyone. Bye.